Oh, well, hello, and bush, and welcome to this week's episode of the Desert Tiger Podcast. Here with me, your host of the DTP, I am the Colton G. And this week on the show, I am joined by Marie Nicola and Chrissy Newton, the hosts behind Alt Pop Repeat. What is Alt Pop Repeat? Well, we're going to give you a little bit of a description on that very soon first off we have to take care of a few things so i just want to mention i love dtp.com if you guys gone and checked out those new snapback hats and beanies yet because we are almost sold out of them we're actually almost sold out of most of the shirts that we have right now too if you're looking for a small an xl or anything more than an xl things are getting pretty tight if you're looking for a medium or a large we still got you covered we're also looking into some female t-shirts and a lot of other designs as well, but those are coming down the pipeline in the future. We also have to shout out the number one marketplace where you are going to go ahead and find a freelancer to step your game up to the next level, and that is Fiverr.com, spelled F-I-V-E-R-R.com. We also have to shout out the premier streaming service for combat sports, and that is Fight TV. Spelled F-I-T-E dot T-V. You can find it on your browser, in your web store, and you're going to find the hardest hitting MMA, pro wrestling, and boxing action right there when you do. All right, let's talk about some hard hitting pop culture and counter culture action right now as we bring you to the world of alt pop repeat. The lines between pop culture and counterculture have a tendency to blur, collide, and cross over each other. Sometimes cyclically as what was once old becomes new again, and sometimes born out of the natural flow of nature and time. What connects these dots? And just how have these niches grown and evolved as technology has grown with them? This is the question that continued to grow between PR powerhouse Chrissy Newton and badass media Swiss Army knife Marie Nicola, the hosts of Alt Pop Repeat. Both have been strongly connected to pop culture through their work in social media, while still finding themselves strongly connected to various countercultures' ideas that, upon further research, they found reached much further than they once previously thought. This is where the idea for Alt Pop Repeat was born. The universe had brought these two powerhouse creatives together so that they could combine their years of experience like Voltron and take on all sorts of topics, like UFOs, what is punk anymore, and astrology among many other topics with various pop culture celebrities influencers, and commentators. So far in Season 1, they have featured the likes of music legend Biff Naked, YouTuber Matthew Santoro, filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, and Canadian media icon and personal hero George Strombolopoulos with more amazing guests on the way as they aren't even halfway through the first season. Marie Nicola and Chrissy Marie join the DTP to discuss alt pop repeat. Along the way, we end up discussing COVID, aliens, cartoons, nostalgia, awkward teenage phases, TikTok, and all sorts of other counterculture goodness. Yes, that is right. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into this conversation with the hosts of Alt Pop Repeat. The Desert Tiger Podcast. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing fantastic. I was just playing with my dog for a little bit before I came Hi. up and got in this party here. How are you doing? I'm good. That sounds like a nice day. Very nice. Very, yeah. very nice change that's, of pace. That's kind of how I've been starting my day. I have a dog too. So in the mornings, I because I'm obviously working from home, I, um, I just give him my cuddles. It's like the only thing I could hug right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> Got to get as many of those in as you possibly can. What kind of dog do you have? Uh, he's a Chihuahua Terrier. Ooh, definitely yeah. good for hugs then. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's my fur baby. 
You know, I'm a little bit concerned though when I like go back to my office and stuff like that, or when I start leaving more, that he's gonna have separation anxiety. Yeah, for sure. Just because yeah. he's probably become used to everything else, right? Yeah, uh, and it, it's yeah. He's. I've noticed that even I'll go and take the like I live in a condo, so I will go and take the garbage out and down the chute, and he just he'll cry for like a moment. I'm like, hmm. geez, I'm like, I've left the condo for like two seconds. He's attached, but you know, it is what it is. I might just start taking, I used to just take him to the office a lot anyway, but you know what? I'm just glad I have a dog. <laughs> yeah. That's always a very good thing for sure. Yeah. Always better than the alternative. <laughs> right. People that are fully alone and don't have pets, like, geez, like at least I have the heartbeat running around. I can talk to, right? So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just something that even if it can't speak back, can at least give you some form of, you know, ability that you can talk to and at least feel that you're getting out the, your energy and your emotions. Yeah, it's well, and even just to have something walking around, that's just your, you know, that's not yourself, right? So yes, very yeah. true to hear another presence. Yeah, which is nice. How's the podcast going? Um, podcast is going really good. We actually just released our hundredth interview last week. So that, congrats. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I'm uh, pretty excited considering it's just something I decided to start when I was forced to take time off of creating my own music. So it's like, well, considering I never thought I'd actually carry this for two and a half years because I was known as quite a procrastinator before <laughs> these things. <laughs> I'm pretty happy that I've carried it this far. How's Alt Pop Repeat going for you guys? I just crushed like all of the episodes. I'm loving it so far. Oh, are you? Thank you. Yeah, it's it's good. It's it's a labor of love. That's for sure. Marie and I are, you know, she's like dealing with the, I'm just messaged her and I'm like, where are you? Um, <laughs> you know, I know she was like, literally told me she was jumping on the call. So maybe something's gone on. I know her computer has been a little bit whack lately trying to jump on calls. But anyway, um, like, uh, here. <laughs> Hey, there you are. Okay, good. I was saying that your computer was a little bit whacked before when we were trying to do a Google Hangout. No, no, no. I got that figured out. Okay. Um, yeah, it's going well. I'm like, we, we, you know, it's a labor of love. I'm like, Marie's like been dealing with the website all day today. So in like the past couple of days and I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm in like tag manager hell right now. It's like the, the joy of being smart enough to read javascript script but it's just too it's like if you have ever if you've ever coded there's a point where at first you're like wow this is kind of like doing a puzzle and all i have to do is like figure out how to unravel this knot and everything will come together but then after like days of doing it you're like i i made really poor choices in my life (laughs) like i should never have done this but when you figure it out, I'm like, I'm the smartest person in the world. I sent a message to Chrissy. I was like, I think I'm legitimately going to cry because I figured out this whole thing that's been killing me for a few days, but I got it. Yeah. Tenacity. Finally got it. Exactly. You pushed through and now you've got that victory and it's all worth it now. It's all worth it. I know. I got my B card. (laughs) (laughs) Mm. Fantastic. That's (sighs) funny. (laughs) <laughs> love it. Love it. <laughs> so otherwise, besides the coding, how is your day going, Marie? It's great. I mean, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much my day. Uh, but great. I mean, I made um, I made some cheesecake, like this fake, Ooh. it's like a fake cheesecake, but it's like a real, because it's like a protein thing, but it's, it, I made it to be a cheesecake. So it's amazing. And so I had that today. I hung out with my cat. Uh, I drank, We're all hanging out with our pets today. Yeah. <laughs> so, drank some coffee and then just got ready to be on like this really fun podcast. And that was it. Well, yeah. awesome. I'm glad that you're excited for that. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you're doing good playing with pets and. Yes. Uh, taking as much time as I possibly can to hang out with the animals as I possibly can. I've also been helping a friend of mine with his essential business. So I've been spending a lot of time on the road lately as well, but oh, wow. what can you do? What can you do? That's, but that's nice though, too. You know, I honestly, sometimes getting working as an essential person is amazing. I'm glad that people are 
or keeping the economy running as much as possible. But even in context of just getting out and doing something else rather than working from home all day, a little envious uh, because it's, it's not easy, especially, yeah, when I was saying before, when you're single, you're just kind of like sitting in your condo working and then, you know, and then you have your pet and then you, you know, walks are the only thing that you really have. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) So I love cooking Chinese food. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) It's always a good way to spend time. Yeah. I love to walk. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) Walks are always good, but no, I understand. Walks are great. I've been trying to take the time to stop while I'm on the road if I can, just to watch some flowing water, maybe send some videos to my friends who I know don't have the opportunity to get out and see some nature for themselves. Yeah, I've been on my social media, you know, creating little videos, doing montages. I'm like, I I don't think I've posted so much on Instagram in my entire life. (laughs) So... People are getting the most random content I can imagine. Like I think today I posted a, a video. Like anyway, yeah, I've just been posting the most random stuff. So a lot of social media activity. I think nice. everybody's. Yeah, I think everyone's doing a lot of. So I know in Maria yeah. the same boat as well too. So I think I've gone in like a new appreciation for cam girls too because like my life <laughs> has. Well, no, my life exists. Are you starting a side business you haven't told me about yet? (laughs) Well, you know, we're working on it. It's called Karma Cake. Is is that really what's going on here? It's called Classy classy Chats. Classy (laughs) Chats. Right. (laughs) And really, it's just like me having like, you know, like a geisha. That's it. You only see from like the neck up and that's it. Um, but no, like my life has been on chats. Like we've been having group chats and birthday parties and, you know, group lunches where my friends and I will like all order lunch together and then we'll go into a zoom chat and have a little meeting. And it's like, it is, it's exhausting because I'm like, Oh my gosh, can we, do we have to have another chat? So I guess like there's a part of me that's just a little introverted. So I'd be happy if, if, um, we could cool it on the social time a little, but I'm also kind of like loving quarantine in a weird way because I don't actually have to leave my place. So it's kind of like six of one, half a dozen of the other, but yeah, being on like, haven't you been doing lots of video chats? You're asking me? Well, Hmm. anybody. I mean, (laughs) I can't be the only one that's just like, wow, cam girls have it hard. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I don't, like, uh, like Colton, I'm, I'm imagining you have been, I've cooled it on the, on the video chats. I, I get really depressed when I close, I not really depressed, but it's, you're by yourself and then yeah. you have like 50 people on a zoom or even 20 or even like one person and then you close it and then it's like instantly silent. Oh, I love it. It's, I hate it. It's so creepy <laughs> for me. I like, I like the subtle goodbye. You know, it's, the subtle goodbye is like, you know, when you have friends over, you're like, great, it's good to see you, it's great. They leave, they go in the elevator, you're like, bye, and you wave out the door, you know, and you have that moment, and then you're like, close the door, and you're like, I had such a great night, you know, instead, like, Zoom, you close it, and it's like, instantly by yourself, and you're like, oh, that's depressing. Mm-hmm. That must be what, like, outer space must be like, just absolute right. silence. Right. What about you, Colton? That's a really good comparison, because I never thought about it, like, outer space because like normally when on weekends like i'm at events and i'm hugging people when they're over and you're saying goodbye and right you get this moment but being from another province like when i try and contact anyone from back home most of that is already audio chats or video chats so right now most of my communication outside of the world is pretty much all through video chats and other things so even that small amount of like personal experience I do get on my weekends is just I am really really missing that because as nice as the audio is is just being able to even just like see the expression on other people's faces in person yeah is just so much different than on video yep yeah it's very true we feel the same thing Maureen I've talked about that a fair amount we've done a couple interviews like digitally Mm -hmm. it's it's you know it's a yeah especially if they live in another like we did one in um in los angeles that's our new episode that's coming out and talking to dr jennifer freed and with her it was great but we've never met her before in person and she's really lovely so it was nice that she was able to have a conversation with us but it's not the same like i'd rather meet somebody and feel their energy and the podcast conversation is different too it's a little bit more livelier yes i agree 
and we feel your pain. I definitely agree because like being in Kamloops, like I resorted to call interviews because trying to contact people in Toronto all the time, I can only go down there so many times a year. Yeah. But even then, it's just if I can get an in-person interview, I will drive hours in order to make it happen just because I prefer being able to actually get the experience of seeing someone because the energy in the room and the energy that ends up coming through the conversation is just so much different. Like this is still an amazing opportunity and the fact that we have this is just very fantastic. But at the same time, just being able to see someone else's energy and vibe off of it and read it and flow off of it is just something I can't wait to experience again. Yeah, we're we're all in the same boat too. And I know Marie and I both like to travel. That's the other part too, like the same with you. I enjoy the traveling part and getting to the destination and then meeting with the person and then like creating a relationship with them. It's just, you can like, I know when we go back out to Los Angeles, we'll go meet Jennifer and create a, a, an in-person relationship with her. But I just, it's just easier to be able to, to do it off the bat. Right. Mm-hmm. So sure. Yeah. I mean, we're, I think we're just like same, uh, a very similar story in different ways. It's just yeah. that we're missing contact with other people. And I mean, especially like when you're doing a podcast and you're so acutely aware of what that interpersonal interaction is like because you have that experience. And then to go abruptly without it, without it entirely, you're like, wow, I'm starting to really take notice of all those visual and interpersonal cues that I've begun to rely on that told me that, okay, the conversation is over, but it's time to switch to a new topic or that they're happy with me or they're confused with me or all, any of these things because, I mean, it doesn't quite translate the same way online. Like I met up with a I saw a friend of mine like um, like weeks ago and she was dropping off some cookies and we were social distancing. So she dropped off the cookies and we're like, thank you so much. And, like pick them up. And we're maintaining the six feet. This is the early days of the quarantine. We're maintaining the six feet distance between us or uh, the measurement or two meters or the measurement of three geese as the signs in Toronto are sharing. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Have you not seen that? No, is, I've not yeah. seen that. <laughs> the signs all around only the city. In right only in Toronto. Only in Toronto. The signs in the city, right? And to measure like, it by beavers now. Like, come on, Canada. Well, I mean, that's two <laughs> meters, really. If you think about it from tip to tail, that's quite, but one goose, because I guess it's like geese season right now. It's one moose. It's, it's a, you have to be one moose apart. That's a, that, <laughs> That is silly, guys. Like, Three goose or one moose? Right. <laughs> so Canadian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that's what, how they're measuring it, you can see. But they don't have it in feet, obviously. It's two meters or three geese. Um, so now I know how how long three geese in a row are. Um, but when she, she drops it off, we're sitting there and we're chatting. But the, the conversation was really uncomfortable because there was something about it because we couldn't be in each other's personal space. Like we couldn't have that, I don't know what you call it, like this electromagnetic exchange. <laughs> I don't know if there's some sort of um, energetic exchange that happens when you're having chats with people. And then when it was time to go, it was so awkward because we're so used to like hugging each other to say goodbye. And we're like, uh. I, but you have to verbalize it. And you're like, well, I guess I, I should go now. It was really nice seeing you. And I can't wait to see you. And then you're kind of overcompensating for the lack of, of um, closeness for the other person. So it's yeah. just the whole thing is even when you do see people in person, it's so bizarre. Mm-hmm. And then it's like you see people crossing to the other side of the road because they don't want to be in your space and you know why they're doing it. But it still feels like you're being rejected. So just- I Real. Yeah. And when is the day that like, is, is someone going to tell us, is the government going to be say, you know, is a day going to come out and be like, you can all hug now and touch each other. Hmm. Yeah. Like, how is, when, it, how are we going to do this? That That's what I'm really curious to say Like the government, you know, like now you can have five people at your house, six people at your house at that point, then you're like, okay, you know, obviously we can, we can touch each other. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> I don't like that's what I wonder, you know, is that we're gonna get a memo that it's okay? Because and it's funny because not everybody has COVID that you know. Majority of people staying at home, you know, and really following the guidelines are fine and they don't have COVID. But it's so crazy that we've been taught that even like even your friend that's been staying at home for like two months doesn't have COVID, that you know, you're scared to touch them. Like it there's a psychological thing there that 
I've been thinking about for a while, but we are so taking over your podcast right now, Colton. Dude, no <laughs> worries. I was just saying, like, this yeah. Is, See, this is, this is the thing. This is the thing about Desert Tiger is I shine a light and illuminate other people with this. My bonus episodes are where I get to do the majority of my talking. So, like, we're getting to know you, and part of getting to know you is getting to know a little bit about your guys' world. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is basically, like, this this is <laughs> this, this is podcast. It. <laughs> this is our podcast. Is yeah, we'll Marina just we'll talking. Talk, and then especially like we're talking about COVID-19, we'll take a look at this and we'll say, "Hey, are there is there anything about this that's emerging that might be a subculture that's coming to light because of this? Is there any trends that we're seeing that are coming out of this? Are there groups of people that have never been seen before yeah. uh, that are developing new traditions and new new um ways of being because of it?" So we kind of like We'll float around a topic and then we'll just kind of dive in. So we're, I mean, as you can tell, we're very much interested in <laughs> COVID nineteen. We're still trying it's to figure taken that over out. a lot of the world, so I can't blame you for being interested in it. And it's definitely like you guys say, what is it going to be like? Like when it finally comes down that we can finally go to concerts and other things? Are people just going to be running out of their houses and hugging their neighbors? Like how? Just how much, what is the excitement level going to be like? Because just this is something that yeah. our world hasn't experienced in a hundred years. And a hundred years ago, we didn't have the technology and we didn't necessarily have the forms of entertainment that we have now. Uh -huh. Like movie theaters are a lot different. Like concerts are a lot different. And like the general yeah. idea of everything is how are people going to react themselves when we're yeah. able to do this is it just going is everyone going to be just overly ecstatic or are there going to be some of those people who decide like maybe i enjoy being trapped inside of my house like well, i Marie. think it's gonna <laughs> Marie's yeah, like, it's me i'll be like i never want to <laughs> leave yeah she's gonna be Can campaigning yeah she's gonna be campaigning the, the covid lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> They're going to be, like, trying to, like, pull me out of my apartment. My arms are going to be, like, wrenched in the door frames. I'm like, you right. can't make me. But I think once we come out of this, we're going to start seeing – I really do think we're going to start seeing um, new subcultures of people that are really rallying around, like, immunity, viruses, and pushing back even more from government because we're starting to see that now. If we've been in quarantine for, what, eight weeks, seven weeks, eight yeah. weeks at this point – so, and we're starting to see the arrest is starting to come. So from that, usually there's, there's some degree of cultural shift that's related to that. So to what degree, I don't know, but I think a lot of people are, a lot of people. Yeah. I have a feeling a lot of people are going to start using because they get so comfortable having zoom chats and doing digital conversations that that's going to happen even more personally. And then I think on the work side, work wise, people are probably going to revolt a little bit because a job that you were told that you can't do at home, you can Absolutely. obviously do at home. So, obviously. right. So I think people are going to revolt a little bit and say, especially if, you know, and corporate companies are telling people they need to come into the office more. I think they're going to say, no, I want to work at home. Cause honestly, it's a, it is a great lifestyle when you can do it at times and you can manage it and you can you yeah. know, manage yourself. Yeah. I think that's going to happen. And I also think commercial real estate is going to go. <clears throat> so at that point, it's, it's going to go, it's going to be really, really cheap, obviously to get probably rent somewhere but i have a feeling a lot of companies are going to start changing the way that they work because people like, are going to demand it honestly I'm, i if i worked for a corporate company that's what i would be doing because you a how much how much yeah right how much money would you save and time would you say for example getting up in the morning getting ready obviously you get ready when you work at home too sometimes i work <laughs> in my pajamas but anyway uh get it. right getting ready jumping in your car making breakfast or even making a shake getting there you know parking getting into your office then saying you know hi to people then starting your day you're four hours or three hours depending on what time you get up or into your day do you know how nice and how much time you would save too and how many things well, you could do outside of it? That's kind of yeah. like Agreed. a lot. It was, it was a part of the lifestyle of the digital nomads, right? The, it was typically the millennials who came out of university, who are driven by experiences, who are traveling around the world, and they didn't want to sacrifice that. So they started to work as a part of distributed workforces. And this was something that was like, that was... Uh, a major part of startup culture mm -hmm. as much as 
and also why co-working spaces thrive because you could be working in London for a month, two months, and then you could travel and work from Vancouver and you'd still be a part of like WeWork would have offices there or your different co-working spaces. So you could live this like digital nomadic life. So you didn't have to have a traditional nine to five. Mm -hmm. I went into that space, mind you, lacking the glamour of traveling all around the world, but I enjoyed having, setting my own hours and working at my own pace and having a certain level of freedom and liberty without being locked down to an office. Tried it, wasn't my thing. But now as the rest of the world are shifting into it, they're starting to see that that can actually create a better work to life ratio. And I think that's really where people are going to push. Parents can stay home with their kids. Uh, I can catch up on my Netflix and still get my Google tag, tagging done. I can, you know, and you can do all these like fun things. But I think the other cool thing that's going to come out of it too is for a long time, and we talked about this in the episode with George Strombolopoulos, which is episode number two of all pop repeat, please tune in. Nice plug, um, Marie. Nice thank plug. you. Good it was job. Good good job. Job. Yeah. Nice plug. Nice Do plug. it up. <laughs> it was a graceful, but I got it in. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> but we did our, when we did the episode with George, we talked about the what we've we've constructed with social media where we have this huge court of public opinion that is just so unforgiving because they hide behind a screen. Oh, incredibly unforgiving. Yeah. Incredibly unforgiving. However, now we're all living behind a screen. So we're a little bit more sensitive, I think. And even seeing the I see, I don't I think like, so. I've been, I've watched the trollers. I actually went on a meme on Instagram and I couldn't believe the trolling. The trolling was insane. And one of them was hilarious. So I had to like calm it back. And I was like, best fight ever. And then left it alone. <laughs> but like, this is hilarious. <laughs> So I don't usually participate. I just kind of, you know, and I don't really, I'm not a troller. It's just not my thing. But I've seen the opposite. I've seen people troll like crazy now because everybody has opinion, open, close, open, close. Like what are we doing with the economy? And everybody thinks that they're economists. Everybody thinks that they're the mayor <laughs> or, the, or part of the government. Like everybody has a comment or an opinion. It's crazy. So I think, I think the opposite. I think trolling like is increased immensely personally I, well I, I, I obviously i disagree maybe they've been maybe their comments <laughs> have been right maybe their comments have been a little bit less aggressive maybe during covid but i just I, feel I, and i've actually participated in more conversations on my facebook than i ever well, i hope have. you were going to say like oh, i was participating in some more like digital witch hunts and go oh, oh. flames of people no no i don't want to <laughs> no, do I'm flame. Do trolling. <laughs> yeah no with, with your trolling persona yeah, My, do you have a trolling persona? No, mine's just, I'm just, uh, I'm, a, I'm a watcher. I'll watch. But sometimes I just laugh because usually cool. I just find them hy hysterical. So, so like one of the other ones though that I was laughing was like best fight ever is this woman called, there was a comment about if that 70s show and Friends are the same episode, like the same, the same type of show. And I disagree fully because I know. Oh, I disagree shows. entirely. Oh, totally just wait, disagreed. Right, right. So then I looked, at the com just wait, I looked at the comments and so this other person was like, yeah, they're exactly the same. It's all for the boomers, boomer remover. I'm like, what? And then this other woman comes in that's, you know, like, in, I think she's 36 when I looked at her Instagram account because I was curious to see who these people were. Totally did some stalking. And she said, she called him a fetus. She was like, she told the millennial uh, uh. that she was like, what do you know, fetus? And then the guy responded back and was like, I have nothing to say because you called me a fetus. And I went, who, what, what, is, what is this? What is this? Wow. And then I wrote best fight ever. And then he ended up actually following me, but they both ended up following me on <laughs> Instagram because I, I, I trolled it, but in a funny way, because I thought the, the conversation was hilarious and and, and first of all, I, I, yes, that 70s show and the Friends are not the same show. Not the same like, show at no, all. Like, not Friends at all. In is any the form, worst show of all time ever produced, in my opinion. I think it's, it is the worst. It makes me want to take a dull spoon and just gouge my eyes out. Every <laughs> See, I disagree. All, I love Friends. They're horrible human beings. The only person, the only redeeming, kind-hearted, and consistently good person on that show is kind of Joey. And the rest of them are horrible. What? Joey? No, he's not. Watch the show now. You're sleeping with all of New York. <laughs> Why don't you Joey like go sleep with them and did. then gets rid of them? Is Where is that Jimmy Joey? I am. You're going to do <laughs> Joey like that. I am doing Joey like that. Yeah. I think Chandler is the one that's probably the best out of all of them. You know, he always think? Get, he works at that nine to five job that sucked. 
And then when he got older, he decided to get into advertising. So he became an intern. He's always sticking up for his friends. He's so committed to, to Monica. They've got like a great relationship. They're best friends. They love each other. They communicate well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go with. I don't know. There's legitimately a list. If you Google it, there's a little bit legitimately a list that's like 25 reasons why Chandler is the worst character on friends. <laughs> And they're not kind. Oh, wow. No, okay. I will admit that they're not very kind friends in most regards at all. They're not kind to other people. I oh, would no, say no, not at no. all. Not they're, so, they're great to their each group. other. Mm-hmm. Right. But that's like Seinfeld. Seinfeld was the same way. You couldn't get into into that group with Seinfeld. They were always like chopping somebody. Well, How I Met so, Your Mother. Yeah, best show. Love that show. Big Love that show, too. That. And even yeah. then, like, if we're going to compare shows, I'd compare Friends a little bit more to How I Met Your Mother. Yes. But even then, still, very different shows. Yes, I agree. And, same, and that 70s show is high school kids that are, like, 16, 17, and 18. You know, they're not talking to 20, 30-year-olds. Very different conversations. And they still live with their parents. Mm-hmm. You know, and they're talking about like how they lost their virginity and, and it's, it's all very different and how it's filmed and yeah, life experiences. But, yeah. You know, that, out. that's like a, that might be the, that's the, that's a, I don't know if somebody is as a millennial is watching it. And I, first of all, I don't even know how they assume that a boom, that friends is a boomer show. It's not, it's not a boomer show at all. No. And even to say that that 70s show is a boomer show, like how? I don't know. Like how old were boomers in the seventies? Maybe they want to reminisce. Mm-hmm. Like it, it is written around the context of the time, but when you're following the life experience of the youth who are the generation who are coming up and who are going to be the change moving forward, which is what our younger generation believes and feels that they want to be as well. So I feel like that almost speaks, should speak to them as opposed to being a boomer culture. They should, I feel like they should relate to that almost. Yeah, it's an awesome show. I mean, you said we have to call a, call a millennial in right now. We get it. <laughs> Can I use my call a millennial uh, card, please? <laughs> got to bring it down. It's Generation Z, right? Because millennial yeah. is your millennial. Mm-hmm. Well, no, I'm an elder millennial. It is Generation Z. But it was a millennial that was commenting on this on this conversation and called everybody a boomer. He's a millennial. He's not a Generation Z. So I'm an elder millennial because I'm 36. But I'm the last year for, or the first year of a millennial story. And then I think now millennials are 2021 now. Mm -hmm. They're around there. Yeah. And that's even just a giant difference between like what you say, an elder millennial, and we'll say, we'll call it a fetus millennial (laughs) to, to say, to compare it there. So the difference between someone like myself, who's 29, 30 years old, and someone who's 21, 20, the experiences that they had going through high school are completely different. The movies that they watched, the politics that were going on in the world around them, completely different environments. Yeah. And I have no problem saying I'm like this whole thing about millennials being lazy and stuff like that. Like it's not true at all. Millennials have grown up in the worst type of economy and are stressed the more than any other generation ever. Like that's actually statistically documented. So I feel for them. If they're trying to live in Toronto or anywhere else in a major city, have fun trying to buy something when they're like 21, 22 or, you know, like it's, it's, it's so hard. So I mm-hmm. feel for them and they are very forward thinking, a lot of millennials. And it's true that boomers might not understand, them, right? You know, mm. I know when I, Marie, you have the same thing when, my, when I'm, I'm the fix it tech person in my family and I'm not even tech savvy, but <laughs> you know, like uh, barely, but I'm the one fixing the Google home and like setting up Netflix and doing all this other stuff for them. And they're like, my dad's like amazed. And my mom's amazed. They're like, you're a genius. I'm like, not really, but keep thinking that, <laughs> you know, I'm like, we're going to keep with that idea. But but for them, they have no idea. So, but before, you know, now it's kind of the tables are turning a little bit. They're like, wow, my daughter like is really bright and like knows what she's doing and stuff. It's like, I kind of always have as a millennial growing up, you just never really considered it. I just so, like, I don't know until why. they started getting a lot older. So. That just reminded me of whenever, like whenever I was younger and I, I, okay, this is, how am I going to say this? It just triggered something. And this is the classic me like derailing everything. But uh, when you're saying like your parents are like, you're the, you're the most techy person ever. It reminds me of when I was a kid and I would go visit like my grandparents or elderly relatives. 
And they're like, oh, you know, I've got to move this chair. And I would pick it up and they'd be like, Marie, you're so strong. And I'm like, it's just a chair, guys. He's like, but you are the strongest person ever. And I was like, yes, I am. I'm a superhero. Uh-huh. Like, I feel like amazing. So on one hand, it's like really annoying to have to be that person for your parents or other people. But at the same time, I mean, it's so validating. It's so mm-hmm. validating. They're like, how did you get my email to load into my email client? I'm like, oh. You don't need to know this information. <laughs> Just call me. Just call me whenever you this problem Just comes call up me. again. Yeah, if I'm a tech, <laughs> if I'm a tech wizard in my family, you're a tech god in yours. That's for sure. I am a tech god. Yeah. So with, yeah. Your, with your coding knowledge and skills, oh. I mean, levels above oh, me. So I mean, phew. yeah. When I there's times that Marie was like, I asked her this morning, and she's like, oh, the website for old pop repeat. She's like, cause she, like we do all, we do all of our stuff in house. Um, mm-hmm. so when, and we do it between each other and we have a, a friend as well that, uh, is a, that produces with us too and helps edit and stuff like that. Shout out to Andre. Um, but anyway, uh, so it's mainly just, it's a small, small group, right? It's a tight group. And Marie this morning sent me, she's like, oh, the website. And I was like, is there any way I can help? And then, you know, she sent me a picture later and I'm like, of JavaScript. And I'm like, no, you're on your own. Like, I have no <laughs> idea. I have no idea. How to get, even if I wanted to try, like, no, like I, maybe it would take me all day to even look up stuff to how to understand to remotely read Java. So Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's, that's not easy, but you're talented in that way, Marie. So that's kind of what's cool about, like, we have the opportunity. uh, And I think sometimes we take it for granted is that we're able to produce so much of the show by ourselves because I mean, even just Chrissy being a PR publicist, me being a digital marketer, and then the other related skills that we have, the backgrounds in doing broadcasting, communication and writing, you name it, even like project management, delegation, hiring great teams, grant writing, et cetera. We're just really lucky to be two people that came together. Absolutely. Um, weirdly enough, by like happenstance, I mean, we were friends for a while, but we ha- were never close. Yeah. And then once we got together and decided to do it, we've just been able to kind of create the entire project ourselves. So, and we know, and it's funny because sometimes we had a meeting yesterday with a potential future teammate, audio producer, and he was saying, he's like, so like, who's hosting your podcast? He's this, I'm like, we're self hosting it. Uh, We're, we've got all the analytics tools to like pull in all the data. We know how many people are listening, how long they're listening to and where they're coming from. But we've all set it up without without having to pay additional for it. But Mm -hmm. I mean, that allows us, those skills allow us to save those dollars and invest it in the areas that we think are most important, like, you know, equipment or going to travel to do interviews with people, you know, back when traveling was allowed. Um, (laughs) Hopefully it will be again. Hopefully. Like by the end of this year, like that would be amazing. But I mean, we've, it really has allowed us our resources and our, our ability to be resourceful has allowed us to really maximize the funds that we have in order to start the program and and i think like build it out because Mm -hmm. i think it would have been a very different story i don't think we would have been able to produce the same quality of show if we didn't have those backgrounds and those skills no No. personally and we're lucky we have a group of people that's uh we meet up once a month with a creators group it's called motu masters of the universe (laughs) <laughs> which is <laughs> they, they came up with the name, which is amazing. So we meet up with them once a month and we all it's it's like a therapy session for yeah. content creators is all we do is talk about what we're doing and we give each other advice in different areas. And it's really nice to have that because you can lean on each other, especially when you don't know what you're doing. If you don't have uh, like if, for example, like we had somebody help us create these captions over our Instagram posts. And Steve ended up helping us do that. And Marie and I are like, I have no idea how to do that. So he, right. And he helps us. So I think that part of having this group of people and friends that you can rely on and work with really helps to and ask for advice and bounce ideas off with because everybody's in the same boat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's like Steve Saylor. We mentioned uh, Steve is Steve Saylor. He's also known as the blind gamer. Yep. So he has a YouTube channel and he also does um, accessibility uh, advising and consulting for all the big game studios. So he's been working with like Ubisoft, you know, and the list goes on, which is kind of cool. So whenever he's coming in, he's really great as a producer, but he might be lacking skills in doing advertising or marketing or, or doing PR. 
So then we kind of come in and we just pool all of our resources together and just kind of help push people along like Chrissy was saying. But it's cool. I love how it's called Masters of the Universe because who don't love She-Ra and He-Ra? He-Man? Well, I mean, you... Oh, my goodness. Right? Yeah. And yeah. I'm like so into the reboot of She-Ra, you can't even, you can't even <laughs> stop. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's awesome, too, because even with like you have like the main parts of the Masters of the Universe, but you have all the other members of the Masters of the Universe where, like you say, maybe they don't necessarily have abilities in every area but they've got this one niche of their skill where they've just got it down pat and they can yep. handle that and there's somebody else who can do their part and together the team is a beautiful thing team is totally a beautiful thing and it's like yeah. this emergence of these accountability groups i'm starting to notice pop up more and more and more and the more i talk about it there's some people who are like wow that's a really great idea and some people are like oh, I'm in accountability group too. Like it's fantastic. And it's the best way for freelancers to have um, that support that people would generally have when they're working in an office. So again, like without even realizing we're creating these structures so yep. that we can continue to be distributed and independent and be entrepreneurial without having to rely on traditional systems. Like we're creating them. It's kind of cool. Yeah. It's yeah. like I'm very much in the, in the now of our lives. I'm like, this oh, is awesome. Yeah. It's, and it's like all the side hustles that everybody has too. You know, a lot of people have day jobs, like Marie and I have day jobs, but the podcast is a side hustle that we love and we create. And, you know, and we put a lot of energy into the one yeah. thing I've noticed that is different from working in PR than going into more of a creator context, because in PR, we work with tons of creators. We work with tons of artists. We work with tons of brands and we, they create, and then we publicize it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we create with them as well too. Sometimes we do that when we're creating cross campaigns and we have to, you know, think outside the box creatively with brands, but a lot of the time we're pushing a lot of the stuff that they have. So on the other end, marketing and PR are great for collaborating, but there's always been a little bit of a there's a competition that happens, I find, a lot too. Not with brands, but other agencies and stuff like that. Yeah. Here on the creator yeah. side, I just, I'm so amazed and, and, and in love with it that everybody wants to work together or find a way to help each other and just want to create cool stuff. And that's where you really, like, I really fall in love with it because I'm like, this is such a great community. And now after work or even if it's on a Friday and, we, you know, and I decide to work on um, Alt Pop Repeat for the day, I can look at other people and we can work together or do stuff on the weekends and everybody's having fun doing it. Everybody wants to create together and it's not a job to them. They just love it and they naturally just want to do things and want to be part of something that's really different and innovative and cool. And I, I, I'm like in love with that. That's the one thing I love because the, the creator community is something that is just unbelievable. Like, and I think, I think that's why we have such a big YouTube world and we have, you know, all those people coming out with new content because everybody wants to create and we can do it ourselves now. And it's mm -hmm. awesome. We don't, have to have, we don't have a big company doing it for us. Mm -hmm. And even to continue to connect this to Alt Pop Repeat, like 10 years ago, like with the beginning of YouTube and the beginning of podcasting, this was a very counter culture mm -hmm. movement at the beginning mm -hmm. of things. And now we've seen the development of creators starting to realize that they can use the crafts that they have learned or they can even use things like YouTube from other people who have taken their craft and shared it and you can go and you can learn whereas before you would have to go to chapters and buy a uh, video editing for dummies book and or even go to a class for it and pay tons of money for these things as well yeah, yeah. oh it's so so true it's true that it's a counterculture. A lot of people didn't know how to use it. A lot of people weren't sure. They didn't want to test it out. And then when certain creators were like, you know what, even if they did, they just set up a camera really quickly and the content was really just, you know, average, you know, and independent, looked independent. That's okay because that's what people wanted. Agreed. You know, I'm, I'm glad that we're getting out of this phase and more and more that everything was so overproduced. So Instagram is one of those platforms that has really, really overproduced. And then we look at TikTok and TikTok's not about being fully overproduced. Like it gives you the ability to do those things, but having a handy cam raw, you and your friends running around and being able to edit it at home, like that's what people want now. They don't really want fully produced pieces that are just so glitz and glam. That's what TV for, it's what Netflix is for and stuff like that. Social has really created that world and 
a hundred percent. It started with the YouTuber phase that now has moved into it and it's created a different way we can consume content and how we look at content. Because a lot of the time, I don't know, maybe you guys, for me, if I was watching something that was independent, it was like, oh, this is horrible. But now I'm just used to it. It's become part of me now and it's become part of the content that I ingest and I enjoy it more. So I don't know. I, that, that shift has happened. Mm-hmm. And that's probably, that's, that's from social media, which is really, really lovely. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's the, there's like these basic tenants when social media started to emerge and it really came because we had like before Twitter and obviously like Facebook existed for spell only on university campuses, but Facebook was very similar to like circle of friends and these other kind of like really early social platforms. Mm-hmm. And we had MySpace, which started to die out around the time that YouTube started to emerge in like 2005, 2006. But the way that it was operating was it was people really loved social media because not only the ability to connect, but the ability to create these transparent, accessible, and like heartwarming vignettes and stories and share openly and honestly, and I say openly and honestly like a lot, but regardless is true. Mm-hmm. Um, in a way that wasn't like Chrissy was saying, that wasn't overproduced. And we got away from that because then we started to get into the platforms and really started to master the platforms. And we started to kind of understand the hacks and what content are people gravitating the most towards and what's driving the most clicks and what do people want. And then we saw that for a period, people were really driving for that aspirational, you know, area. I kind of blame the Kardashians for it because... (laughs) Keeping up the Kardashians also was really big and they were showing a very aspirational lifestyle, a very wealthy family, and they just kind of like snowballed. And so with that, we started to see more people creating more produced content on Instagram and all these other platforms that are coming out. Mm-hmm. But we're so tired of it because there's nothing to connect to. You're connecting to an image of a person. You're not actually connecting to a somebody in real life. You can't relate to it. So this like area of relatability, I think, is that's like the most powerful thing. Even the newest influencers on Instagram now are, are not producing heavily. They're like all younger. Also, sidebar, why is it on everybody on TikTok is like 16 and they're all stupidly hot? <laughs> <laughs> like, did you, I did not look like that when I was what, 16. What happened to the awkward phase? Please tell me. I don't think that exists anymore. Because like I was an I was an ugly duckling from between like twelve to like twenty three, and I don't know what happened to everybody else because they just skip right past that phase now. They do. I just feel like there's something they're missing a period, a humbling period in their lives. They will never get back. Maybe that's actually maybe that's what they call like they're peaking too early. So by the time they hit twenty three when the rest of us are kind of like growing into our looks and we're not tripping over ourselves or as much, they're all just going to fall flat. So. Cause who knows how it's going to affect their confidence and everything else. Once they've felt like they've already been this way, once the years of age start to get to them, is it going to hit them harder than it's hitting us who maybe feel we're graging more acefully, gracefully because we didn't necessarily have that gap or we, skipping in between where we had those awkward phases yeah I had those awkward phases oh my god I went through a whole phase where I only wore like I was committed to chokers and headbands <laughs> and that was like a hard like I want to say a good one and a half years of my life and I had this one headband and it was like a daisy headband and I was like I am going to be like this nouveau 1960s hippie delight kind of girl that was like my vibe and I was <sighs> But now looking back, I kind of regret it because I also had really big glasses. So it wasn't a great look. But hey, like I, I had that experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if I was, if I was 14 right now and had the internet and beauty makeup tutorials and like skincare products that are way better than Noxzema, you know, I would, we'd be looking better too. Very like, true. They, they, you know, they've come out with a lot of products and just consumer brand wise have really upped their game and also makeup tutorials. Like nobody was contouring when I was in high school, you know, we were wearing like 
horrible lipstick and, you know, like not blue eyeshadow, but mm-hmm. close enough and like really bad blush and, you know, like lip liner, brown lip liner. Like it's just, it, it wasn't pretty. I liked your look. You showed me right. pictures of you in high school. I was like, you're cool. You also had like those, didn't you have a pair of the Tims with the heel on it? I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it, it was a Beyonce boot. Yeah. I really liked that. Fa- I still like fashion as an adult, but yeah, I really liked fashion when I was in high school, but it doesn't mean that you know, I was, I was one of, I grew up at a, a country high school. So imagine like head to my Instagram, <laughs> I'm going to pro- promo myself here, go to Atmos vocab and you will see my high school. And that was a semi-formal outfit. I was wearing like army and like Tim's and like, oh yeah. Like I was full on Girl, like, trying to live like, my Beyonce Destiny's Child you're, lifestyle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> your country, your country high school is like oh, yeah. so it's much cooler than what I, I was like, you're a big city man. If you could get Tim's without having to drive all the way to Halifax to buy them, you're living in a big city. Right. That's true. So we should explain. So I'm, I grew up an hour outside of Toronto on a dirt okay. road that, that was rural. And I went to like a rural high school. So very farm, you know, hickey high school that I, that I love. Mm-hmm. And I still have friends that I talked to that I've known since I was like six years old. Oh, and Marie is the, awesome. Marie's, thank you. And, and Marie is, but she grew up a different type of like country lifestyle. Like you're an East coaster. So yeah. I'll let you explain that. But I we both did not grow up in Toronto. PI. Yeah, yeah, we no, were not did not grow up in Toronto. No, but it was like Summerside, PEI. Like I can't legitimately. My town was not even a city. It was, city. It was classified as a village. Okay. Um, and then by the time I was like in my teens, we had become a town. But then we reverted because then they got rid of like CFB Summerside. So then we didn't have enough population to be a town. So we went back to being a village. And then somehow we had a boom when they built the bridge. And then we became a city, but I think we had like one person extra. So it was like, we had like 18,000 people. And I think we had 18,001, but because we had that one person, we qualified as a city. Uh, uh, so uh, then uh, uh, uh. we got like, the whole city was like excited. It was like this cute little movie. There's, there's like this British movie where this entire town uh, is defined by this mountain that they have. But when they actually get somebody in to measure it, they realize that it's actually just a large hill. And the whole entire town is like devastated. So it's kind of like what Summerside was. Summerside was like, we're a city because, you know, we weren't. And then by the time we had, we're like, technically we're a city now. So we're just going to call ourselves the city of Summerside and we're going to get a new coat of arms. We're going to have a big party and it's going to be great. And let's hope nobody leaves. (laughs) So that's kind of like my, my town was cute. We had a lot of lobster, (laughs) ran in fields made of sunflowers and um, played on the beach all day. Yeah. See so yours. Yours is. Yeah. See, that's, that's nice. Mine was go to a country high school. We like, you know, would go to like, go to Tavistock or like Stratford. That's where did Justin Bieber grew up. Hmm. Yeah, we did. But then we, yeah, we'd have Bush parties and then. Oh my, my goodness. I, yeah. I had a friend. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. We were very much those high school kids. And then we would go and have, yeah, like Bush parties or we'd have house parties. So in like grade nine, we'd had a house party and I totally told my parents that I was going somewhere else. And then I lied to them, obviously. And then I went to this rager house party. And then what we would do in Tavistock, like it was like a weekend thing. Somebody would have a rager and then the cops would show up because they have nothing else to do in the country but just to, to break high school teens house parties up. And then they bring out the searchlight and then we'd run in the field because you had to run uh-huh. away. And the only place you're going is into a cornfield or just a, a you know, field in general. And then you'd All have your to cars are behind you, of course. Well, well, no, like most of the time we were walking or our parents are dropping us off. So, oh, dang. Right? right. Oh, yeah. Because we weren't driving when we were four, like 15. So, mm. you know, and so by that time, you know, when we started getting cars, it was different, but they would drop us off. And then, or drop us off at a friend's place. And then we'd all walk over to the house party, but then the cops would break it up and then they bring out a searchlight and then the searchlight would like scan the field and we would run and then they were looking for us and you'd hide behind stuff. And yeah, it was a, he weird. had like, I, like never like that's what I thought that's what like what city people would do. Like when, you know, getting into wow. trouble. Do you uh, have we were flashbacks now when you watch ET? <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, no, the, the only flashbacks I have that are horrible about E.T. is when he's in that little ditch in the in the water and they're and the the humans are trying to find him and capture him, the scientists. You guys remember that scene in E.T.'s yes. in the water? Yep. It's just it's so I watched it recently with my friend Dan and and we went to go watch it on um, what's it called IMAX and I, I, I cried 
he cried. We actually brought his parents too because they love ET, so we all cried. And I said to him, I was like, that ditch scene is just I, like who does that to a little child and the first time they watch ET? It's it's devastating to a child. It's and he's like all like he's all like ragged and white and like it's just he's like about to die. Like it's so sad. It's so sad. I, I mean, mean even Spielberg, what are you doing to us? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> He's, he's reminding you that you're human because you got the feels. Yeah, it is. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, he takes you, <laughs> he takes you on, an, on an adventure, emotional roller coaster. You know, and then after E.T.'s in the little plastic thing with his, I forget the boy's name now, the friend. And he's like, E.T., no, like, no. And he's like losing his mind. I, like, I couldn't handle it. I was like, I got to get out of the theater. <laughs> like, it's like, like I'm, a, I'm a 36-year-old woman freaking out over like, <laughs> you know, a, a fake a fake alien. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm saying that it was like much. Where, it was triggering you when they were searching through the bush for E.T. <laughs> right. And the searchlights were going. It took you back to a time. And that's why you have a really strong response to it. Let's go back to all pop repeat for for a second just because we were talking about aliens it was we did our first episode was really cool because we did a show with jeremy corbell and then yes. as a part like we did another we did like this recording at one point and i had asked uh what's your favorite pop culture alien and i just wanted oh. to know, what's your all time oh man see like i actually like really enjoyed that episode with corbell and listening oh. to it like when you guys were talking about area 51 and just how different it was in pop culture it made me think back to how one of my first experiences with area 51 was watching a scooby-doo cartoon (laughs) based on the subject you know and that's that's how i learned about the concept of area 51 was scooby freaking do all right before we go any further i just want to take a quick moment to stop not only just because you know we have to pay a few bills but also i want to ask you guys the ambush while we're talking about scooby-doo and aliens have you guys seen the fan theory that Scooby-Doo is actually an Anunnaki? That Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo are both aliens from outer space? Yeah, it's a pretty crazy theory. Of course, it came out after I had this conversation with Marie Nicola and Chrissy Newton. And we're going to continue that conversation further about Scooby-Doo, about all- Fraggle Rock, about dinosaurs, all other amazing awesome things that are going to be coming up in this conversation as we also continue to talk about pop culture and counterculture here with the hosts of alt pop repeat so let's pay a few bills and get back into that so first off i just want to talk about fiverr.com that's right that is f-i-v-e-r-r.com and fiverr is the number one online marketplace where you are going to go ahead and find yourself a freelancer to help you step your game up, bring up your production to the next level, whether you're a streamer, a YouTuber, a musician, whatever it happens to be, they got somebody that can hook you up with a logo, maybe some banners, some badges, whatever it is you're looking for, even some editing. They have all various different types of freelancers who are ready right now waiting for you to help you in progressing yourself and bringing your game to the next level it is fiverr.com f-i-v-e-r-r.com we are also brought to you today by the largest online streaming service for combat sports and that is fight tv Yes, Fight TV, spelled F-I-T-E dot TV. You can find it on your web browser, and you can find it in your app store. And when you do, you're going to find the hardest-hitting combat sports action around because not only do they have incredible pay-per-views that you can go and pick up, they know that some people are hurting still during this time of the COVID crisis, and that's why they've gone ahead and launch the Fight 24-7 channel so that they constantly have something going on. Plus, they have amazing free content on Fight TV as well. So what are you waiting for? Get in the App Store, download it, and get in the action today. We're going to continue on with the action here with Marie Nicola and Chrissy Newton of Alt Pop Repeat. Let's get back into some alien talk. The Desert Tiger Podcast. (laughs) You gotta send me that link. 
I gotta watch yeah. that. That's in my. I didn't know Scooby Doo did a whole Area Fifty One segment. I'm pretty sure I remember there being a movie where he went there and there was like an alien, and I remember this entire thing where I'm pretty sure my dad showed me it because my dad was a giant Scooby Doo fan, and I ended up asking him. I was like, "What in the world is Area Fifty One?" You imagine being an adult and your child comes up to you and says, that "Because of a, a cartoon." They know about a secret, you know, military base that was like a huge conspiracy theory for years. And then your dad and then the kid asks who Bob Lazar is like that to me. If if I ever have children and a child asks me that, I'll be like, we were meant to be. This was meant to happen. I was meant to have you. You are you are a mini me. I love you so much more now. Like, yeah, okay. it'd, be, it'd be such a cool moment. But yeah, that's that's Scooby Doo. Like, ahead of their I love, I love you very much. But now it's time to drop you off at your first bush party. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need to have you need to have the alien hunt a vibe. Uh, yeah, Chrissy, it's Scooby Doo and the Alien Invaders 2000. Yeah, Scooby that's what it in, was. Wow. Scooby and the gang get stranded in a remote desert town that's full of eccentric people, UFO sightings, and strange going ons. Wow. And of course, they uncover a sinister plan. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but who's the alien? So here's the question then is, is if there's an alien in the end, then who's really the alien when they take off all the masks? I can't remember. You know, when they're, they're like, ah, and it wasn't this person, and ah, it wasn't this person. Like, well, that's the all... best part about Scooby-Doo. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. But, it I mean, is. There's, yeah. there's, that's the treat to discover for you, like, whenever you're that watching is. it. I'll, I'll watch it. Spoiler alerts here. Well, I've been watching, I have to, I'll put it in between my Fraggle Rock uh, episodes. I've oh, been, my I know. goodness. I've been catching up on oh. Fraggle Rock, and it's, it's changing my life. Like, I, I realized haven't. when I was, you got to watch it, Colton. I haven't I seen kid. that show since I was a kid. Like, yeah. honestly, Fraggle Rock and Dinosaurs. I haven't watched yes. either of those shows since I was a tiny, tiny child. Yeah. And both of them are incredible. Honestly, like, I realized, I watched, I went to the first episode of Fraggle Rock. So I'm like, I'm going to start from the beginning. So I started and I went, wow, I'm a weird child. Like, I was a weird, <laughs> weird child back then because I really... Like the Fraggle Rocks are living in their own little world and, and then they have this human world and then you have their, uh, the, oh my God, the Gorgs that have another world, but then they have the Trashy, but that's an Oracle that lives with the Gorgs, but I don't think the Gorgs know about the Trashies, only the Fraggles. It's it, to me, it just, I told my friend about it after I was like, do you really analyze Fraggle Rock? <laughs> He's like, no, I'm like, watch it. It's I'm like, watch it. Show. It is such a good show. And it, it's a classic and it, it should be, do you... I don't want them to remake it because they'll just kill it now. No, but... they can't. Oh, they absolutely would. Yeah. They Jim Hansen, Jim Hansen's it. a genius. He's I literally still remember the theme song. Like I could, that and the Lilith Hobo theme song, I could anytime, anywhere. Oh, I'm, yes. I'm just like, every time I think of Fraggle, Fraggle Rock, I think of like, Wembley and Gobo in the yeah red. I can I can picture the like screen of the intro in my head right now and just them singing. Yeah, yeah. go watch it. Go watch it again. Oh, it was good. Yeah. I need to. Yeah, it I will. need to. Wow. Yeah, it's and, and honestly, the writing is really good, and you realize how wonderful Gobo is. Like the, all of the characters are just so good, and and then they have little songs. So you know, <laughs> again, I'm gonna. Shout out to my Instagram. I did my montage. I was like, I did a progression of my progression of feelings during COVID and a Fraggle Rock montage. So I took Wembley singing about him staying in his place and him never going anywhere. It's this beautiful little song. And then after I segued into like them being stuck in a jail because the Gorgs like captured them and they're all singing a song about how they have to get out. It's just, it's so good. And it's so good. Like, you just don't see that anymore in cartoons. Well, it's- the brilliance of Jim Henson's studio. Yeah, I mean, take I a look at like what what they've done and how they've transformed our lives. We've just grown up watching them. Like, yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. Even even the level of depth, like just off the description that you gave, yeah, the level of depth that has to go into creating the show alone with the oracle that exists within this one group, but they possibly don't know, but this other group knows that it exists there, and to come up with these concepts and everything else, and then. You go and watch some TV shows today, and it's literally just toopy toopy beano beano. Oh yeah, that's ex- exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. I would actually tune into that show. Won't lie. <laughs> it's uh. honestly, yeah, Fraggle Rock is just it's next level. The trashy though, when I when they went to go ask the trashy the Oracle for questions and like or answers to questions, they have like two little 
buddies that are friends that protect the Oracle and like awaken the Oracle. And they have these little like side chats with each other and like the side commentary. It's just, it's really just brilliant. Like that's some Greek mythology level stuff. Oh, it is. It is. And like for a little kid, I never got it to that capacity until I got older and I went, this is so much better as an adult. But that's why those shows like, that's why everything that came from Jim Henson was so good because everybody could watch it. Yes. Like think about, again, going back to Sesame Street, they would have, they had this whole skit that was based around Twin Peaks and was called Twin Beaks. And instead of saying <gasps> damn fine <sighs> pie, they'd be like, that's some darn fine pie. Like they, they adapted stuff to teach kids but it was entertaining for parents too. And that's kind of what made it so good and what makes it so enduring. That's why it's like, you can watch Fraggle Rock now in your thirties and also watch it when you're a kid. It's like, it's awesome. It's like perfect, but they've never quite like, since they lost Jim Henson, they, they never really, it hasn't been the same. Like without him, it's not quite like a shout out to like a great Canadian cartoon. I don't know if you guys ever watched the raccoons, Oh, that was Canadian. Yes. Yeah, that was Canadian. I had no idea that it was Canadian. Yeah, it's yeah. a Canadian show. And, wow. And the whole thing was like, it, what I I didn't get from it until I was older, was the fact that the raccoons all they did was fight against the industrial aardvark corp- corporation that was trying to decimate the forest. So there, it was like this environmental anti corporation respect nature band together be a team know your family that whole storyline was like that was the raccoons wow was, wow he's crazy and their whole entire thing was like how do they make and like um uh cyril fuck man i can't believe i remember so much of this cyril sneer cyril sneer was like the art bark was like the nose that was pointed down always had a cigar in his mouth and they basically through the throughout the entire season when they got to the very end of it they started to make him an actual sympathetic character because the raccoons were like, he was their ne- nemesis, but they kind of like wore him down with like education and understanding that in the end, he, he was a bit of a redeemed character. Hmm. Uh, wow. Side note, I just looked up, I'm buying the edition on Amazon, Fraggle Rock, 35 sure. bucks. I'm, I just bought it. And I will tell you, Colton, I just found that the dinosaurs, the complete first and second season is only $20 on DVD on Amazon. Oh, my goodness. I might have to make a, <laughs> an Amazon order as soon as this conversation is over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we have, like, all the, the nostalgia. This is welcome to the world of Chrissy and Marie, where yeah. we sit and, like, <laughs> reminisce about the days of yore and then... <laughs> right. The impact on our lives today. And on so, side notes, we do majority of the time, Marie and I are probably watching more documentaries, not just Fraggle Rock, but we're in COVID <laughs> mode. And, and you know what? Frag- <laughs> Fraggle Rock is, is just lighting up my soul. So it well, is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Sometimes you need those things that light up your soul, just like your guys' friendship has done with each other as well. Yeah. Yeah. Aww. Yeah. It's friend- good segue. <laughs> oh, there's so much love. <laughs> yeah. I actually really want to know what exactly what cosmic force ended up deciding that you two ended up having to meet and creating alt pop repeat. Uh, we were going through breakups. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. you're telling the you're telling the real story, Marie. But that's, that's it. I mean, it's, it's true. We don't, yeah. It's not. We don't have complicated feelings about any of that. It was just. But that's yeah. what happened. We were both going through breakups, and we we're just like. But there's weird things. Like when you go through a major breakup in your life, there's like these weird events that happen because all the things that you've been holding back from or people you have have been threatening to see for so long, all of a sudden it kind of like all comes at you at one point and you're just like, okay, I was really sad for a little bit, like a couple of weeks. Yeah. And then now all of a sudden, everything that I've ever wanted, the people and experiences and the projects and everything are now just kind of like pummeling me. And I'm just so excited. And I'm so happy. So it's kind of like Chrissy was, for me, was in that wave of that period in my life where it's like all the awesome things were coming and saying, okay, you had your breakup. Now that's done. Now look at all the awesome things that are happening. And so mm-hmm. that's kind of like my metaphysical wow. um, manifesting kind of take on, on the whole thing. Yeah. And go on. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. And in addition, Marie and I, 
like the same things. We both like to talk. We're both super opinionated, as you can tell, you know, in both ways. And we also... <laughs> Nothing wrong with either of Right. And we, we also really enjoyed looking at certain subjects and really taking them apart and deconstructing them and finding, mm-hmm. like, connections to them, you know, if they're linear or not. You know, that was... We really would just naturally do it in conversations and we still do it. We call each other and we'll talk for hours, you know, compared to people that don't even really talk on the phone. Well, before COVID, we generally do that and, and naturally really gravitate towards the same things. So that's kind of, I think that's part of that marriage as well too, you know, that, that goes with it, with the show and everything else. Yeah, I think, and, and obviously, like, I agree that there was something that probably brought us together. We were going through similar experience in a similar time. And those things really come together. And, you know, when you go through hardships, sometimes really great crafts and really great art and different things that come out of it or stuff like podcasts or, you know, maybe Marie and I'll do a painting next. Like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. But like really good things come out of shitty times and a really great thing came out of a shitty time. What I would say is, is all pop repeat. Can I say shitty on the podcast? Is that okay? Well, okay. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, I already dropped the F-bomb at least right. once. So right. cool. <laughs> and I am perfectly okay with that, yeah, too. Yeah, so I would say, like, that's that's it. And then also, yeah, it opened up a lot of other doors. You know, I've always wanted yeah. to do another side of being a content creator since I've been younger. You know, that's always been something that I loved. And, you know, I think we we feed off each other. We're, you know, we both have a love for content creating. Even though we work in PR and digital, there's another side of it, and we both get to express it, which is really, really yeah. cool. Yeah. And it makes it, it makes me happy. Like in the end of it, I said to Marie, even if this doesn't, you know, say our show didn't, you know, it doesn't have like 5 million listens and whatever. I don't care. I'm, I'm really happy that I'm really thankful we have an audience right now and it's growing for sure. But I'm just really happy I get to do something I love because it makes me happy a lot. Yeah. yeah. Even if you make just a small impact, even with like an audience of a couple thousand or a couple hundred thousand, even if you don't hit a million mark, even then, like you're going to influence somebody down the road and that somebody is going to go on to create something more and may even possibly end up connecting with you later on and who's to say that what are you two gonna end up going on to create as a team for or down the road yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. we're like because we have um we bring to the podcast different opinions and different thoughts that we don't always agree on things but we have this fundamental and wonderful trust between us that allows us to have those differences of opinions and share them with people where we're not like, we're not all sunshines and roses the entire time. We are not always these like poly positive Pollyannas all the way through the show, which I think makes us a little bit different than some other people because we're not trying to be anything other than ourselves. And we're not trying to do anything than represent the best of what we know in the world at that moment. And the other Mm -hmm. thing is, is that when we're talking with people and I've said this before, we've done like interviews with, um, with some people before. And I said, like, look, like, don't hold back, share what you say, put, put yourself at issue, share those opinions, because this is a safe environment. And we're not here to create drama, like, not drama, but you know, controversy for you. But we want to be, uh, we want to represent our audience fairly, to ask the things to put our own, I'll say ignorance is a really strong word, but to put our own, um, our own shortcomings out in the world and have those conversations so that other people know that it's safe to do that. So if I have terminology that I've been using forever that might be considered insensitive to some, then I really trust Chrissy and the guests to be able to come back to me and educate me otherwise, because I think that also makes for a stronger show because we're also showing people that you can have positive Mm -hmm. conversations without jumping down people's throats all the time. Well, you need to be able to grow as human beings as well. And growth requires you to learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We're not perfect. Right. And learning. You know, and maybe in next season, we and I have talked of things like getting, because we have a lot of pop culture people that are part of the show, which is, which is part of the show as well. But talking mm-hmm. to people that really live more in the counterculture world, you know, could be a second season with us. And those conversations are for sure going to be a little more difficult because you'd have someone like an MRA or you have somebody who has a very, very distinct difference in opinion between Marie and I. So those questions are going to get harder. The conversations are going to get harder, but like Marie said, we're not here to attack anyone. We're all here to listen and say, well, here's a platform. You tell us what you think and we'll say what we think and have a discussion on it. Because 
that's how I think you create understanding. And that's how people start to listen to someone else's side. They don't have to agree on it. Marie and I don't have to agree, but what we can do is give a platform to say our side of it along with them, give theirs and have a real discussion of why these things happen and why they affect people and why that person might think that. Mm. And it's like the MRA thing is, is a hard thing for so, sure it is. Yeah. to like resolve with because as two women hosting the podcast, that would be inviting somebody into our environment that fundamentally don't think that don't believe and don't understand that we are thinking, breathing people that have our own uh, free will. They think of us as inferior beings just because of our gender. So it's a hard space to kind of resolve with that, to kind of give them a voice. I'm also not like entirely in love with the idea of trying to validate MRIs as an actual thing. No, I think mm-hmm. that's just all go to hell. But <laughs> right. Um, mm-hmm. But the other side of it too is like, it's a good point on going to controversial topics because pop culture Pop culture as, because obviously our show, Alt Pop Repeat, because we didn't say this a little bit earlier, Alt Pop Repeat is an exploration of the counterculture subcultures and alternative cultures that have driven and fed pop culture. So we map out the sinks between those sub counter and alternative cultures to pop culture. Like what is the watershed point? When did that happen? And how are we see, still seeing it manifest in pop culture today? Yeah. The pop culture is not created in vacuum. And all of these little subgroups here are, those are quite often relating on, on topics of our history, race, sexism, you name it. Because some, a lot of it is a part of cultural appropriation even. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what really makes it hard for a lot of people to dive into this topic if they're so committed to the way that they are and what their belief structures are. Chrissy and I don't have that. So if we're going to go into a conversation with somebody who is a major player within like the modern black civil rights movements, then we're going to have an open and honest conversation with them because we want to learn. We're going to put our, 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 well, I will, I can't speak for Chrissy, but I'm going to put my own prejudices out on the table because that's the only way that our listeners are going to get that reflective to really see it show like, shine back. Now I'm an ally. I'm an ally of all. I love everybody. But at the same time, I'm a product of my conditioning. That's Mm -hmm. it. I have a certain level of privilege as somebody who is white passing. I am like Arab and I'm British. So I've never had to struggle with the same struggles as somebody who's grown up black. And that's cool. And I want to like learn more. But again, that's putting myself at issue and the things that I've, my conditioning and the things that I've learned at life. Um, in order to have a really profound and and worthwhile conversation about cultures and appropriation that help driven our, our pop culture today. So yeah. it's like a mm-hmm. big exploration. Yeah, and I would say even the counterculture side too. You know, we talk a lot about past counterculture that influences present, but we have a lot of, like you were saying before, Colton, you know, a lot of counterculture that's happening now. And so that's something that Marie and I, you know, have to look at and and understand because there are subgroups and there are counterculture groups that are will become the norm in the next 20 to 30 years that will become into that populace and what is that going to look like so they're happening all the time counterculture is always happening subculture is always happening and obviously our mainstream you know north american western pop culture is happening as well too so we look at we look at all of it and and having conversations around it because it's never going to die. You know, as long as humans are around, we're always going to be creating some form of culture around us. Um, and it's always going to change. And now like back to COVID, you know, I wonder how that's going to change. We're getting lots of conversations about civil rights right now. You know, how is that, is it moving forward? Is that going to change the way that civil rights are? Because obviously civil rights is a, is a counterculture movement in a, in a time that has obviously now what we, we look at mainstream populace and we see how everyone has different rights, right? Yeah. Because of people that went through really, really hard times for us. But now we look at, wow, we've never been able, you know, some people in different countries are stuck in their homes and, and the government's telling them they can't leave. You know, for here, certain things you can't do, you're getting ticketed going to certain places. That's, that is 100% taking away different liberties as well. Mm-hmm. So out of COVID, we're going to have conversations that are counterculture movement movements people are protesting now things like that some maybe a counterculture will come out of that based yeah. on civil rights so and, yeah. oh, cool. I no no but that but that that's that's the end of my thought but I, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um i i'm very curious to see and 
hopefully this show keeps going even longer so that Marie and I, you know, we get to look back at our first episode and go, wow, we were dumb. And then, you know, or we're like, man, we were brilliant. I know I'm just joking. But then we, then we look back, let's say maybe 10 years later and we're like, whoa, like, do you remember that as counterculture? And now this is what we're in now. Like that would be, that would be the most amazing thing for us to be able to do is look back on what we've done presently and then comment on that and keep, always like evolving and, and having different conversations about culture. Yeah. yeah. And it's like mm-hmm. going back to COVID, yeah. um, we are starting. So that concept of privilege, we didn't really know what that was. Like we, we had a sense of what was to be privileged, but now we really do because you can have, if you have a home that you can quarantine in, if you have the luxury to quarantine somewhere and you don't have to go and work in the grocery store and you don't have to go and work on the front lines or be you're not one of those essential workers that is privilege man how lucky are you that you don't have to go do those things right Absolutely. and we're starting to understand that those people that are are making sure that our lives are still running with some certain like yeah. normalcy the men her men and women that are picking up our garbage every day the police officers that are on our street making sure that even though we're not all out in the street but you know people's businesses that are shut up are staying safe. Because all of those people are, are really, you know, we took them for granted for so long, the TTC operators. Um, I could go on and on and on with all the people that have to go out and work every single day mm-hmm. because they don't have the luxury or the privilege to be home. So now we're starting to like, I think for the first time in a long time, that even though we in North America don't really consider us, well, especially in Canada, we never really considered ourselves as having a class system. We're starting to see yep. that we kind of do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how that's going to impact the way we move forward. I, I, I don't know. I don't even know. Yeah. Like, I'm just really grateful that I have a beautiful apartment that I can, you know, stay in and I can work late if I need to. And I can paint my apartment whenever I need to. And I can have like, take time out of my day to have these wonderful conversations with you, Colton, that, you know, if I, if I had to, if I had to help keep society moving in a different way in an actual real functional tactical service level kind of way, I want to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So I agree. And I'm, I'm thankful that those people are, we still have an economy because of those people. Mm. Yes. We wouldn't have an economy and it, we'd be in a really bad position if we didn't have people going out to, you know, work in grocery stores, doing deliveries, things like that. Oh my gosh. And, and it also, it does, you're right, Marie, it, create, it shows for sure we have a class system and how we have to, you know, validate each other in different ways and respect each other and give respect oh. to each other in different ways. Yeah. It's very we true. Pay our government to make sure that we have servants. Like I never thought that I had people to serve me in that way ever before. But if I didn't have something, I'm not going to take my garbage to the dump. Someone else does that for me. You know, I, mm-hmm. I really, well, I don't think they're, I don't consider them servants. <laughs> they're, they are civil servants. Right. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. But, but, but I, yeah. Of them that term, and I'm so grateful for the work that they do and yeah. what they do in order to allow me to live my life. Absolutely. I am just, I'm privileged and I'm really, really thankful for it, but I never really thought about it. I was just like, oh, I don't have extra money, so I can't get a house cleaner. I don't have. I don't have those like individuals who work as like domestics in my home. But the truth of the matter is, is that we've created a structure uh, for a society to, because we're so lucky and we're so wealthy as a society that we're allowed to, as, as a group to hire people to do all these small services for us in order to make sure that we're, which is crazy. Like it's, it's just kind of a different twist on, on thinking on the value of people's work it's so valuable well absolutely like even from my own standpoint like two days ago uh our water heater went out and you have to sit there and like that affects your ability to wash your hands when you get home and everything else so like not only does it affect your comfort level it affects coming home and possibly dealing with other people are you spreading things onto other things so then it comes down to like can I even get a plumber in? And the fact that we could even get a guy in in one day, it's just like, it makes you really thankful that not only does this person exist, but like they're willing and able to actually take the time to make sure that other people have the ability to make sure that they're just alone clean. Yep. And it's like, let's go back in time, back in time. Let's, let's go back to, oh gosh, we could even go back to relatively recent times 
uh, a lot of people did not have running water in the way that we we measure running water. Yes. Back into like the 30s, even the 40s, uh, a lot of people didn't have it. It just wasn't a part of it. A lot of people who lived down in the country were living off of like well water. Warm water was something reserved for for the elite. Mm-hmm. But we're so wealthy as a society that we're able to to have that pumped into our homes like it ain't no thing. Mm-hmm. So it's only human right to have clean running water. I don't know if it's necessarily human right to have hot water. Yeah. <laughs> so you're just yeah. like, dude, it's crazy. It's crazy. I'm just so grateful. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just like so much more grateful for the life that I have right now mm-hmm. and the people that are contributing to make it happen. But it really kind of puts a lot of things in perspective right now. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think I'm going to come out of this. I wasn't an ungrateful person before, but I think I'm going to come out with it a little bit more, I don't know, feeling like I'm a lot richer than I thought I was. <laughs> Yes, definitely. I agree. Because even though there are other places in the world where you still have to do things like boiling water and other things, like you mentioned, like we haven't had to do a lot of these things for the last 100 years, thankfully for a lot of us. And some of us even still were doing them within even the last 50 years, even less than that in a lot of these situations. So the fact that like we don't have to do that, because when you think back to the amount of time and effort it requires just alone to make sure that your family is clean the fact that we can like have those abilities of just plumbing alone to get the water into our houses it's so many things that you don't even think about at first and then once you actually realize it it's like we have it pretty damn good we have it pretty damn good and it's like if we're learning anything right now and i think this might kind of move into how we as a society and how our pop culture is going to shift slightly is the, we're starting to realize we can do things for ourselves. I mean, you take a look at any of the quarantine memes, people are making bread, they're making yogurt, they're like, they're They're growing lettuce, they're growing (laughs) lettuce, they're out of their old lettuce. Yeah, (laughs) out of their old lettuce, people are becoming, are realizing that they have access to so many things that they didn't have to figure out how to grow their own lettuce because it was so convenient to go to the grocery store and it's not anymore where it was they took advantage of the fact that you could go and just buy bread but again it's inconvenient to do that so everyone's trying to to they're figuring out the DIY way of maintaining their standard of living but at the same time they're realizing that they're saving oodles of money yes and they can do it themselves and when they do do it themselves they get a lot more satisfaction out of it so i'm really curious to see how I think that is going to be like a major piece on how we are going to be as, as a society once we come out of this. And I don't know, like maybe it's like the pop culture tie-in would be like, we'll have all those DIY channels on, on Instagram and TikTok are going to turn into, you know, megawatt channels and, you know, who knows, but I think it's kind of like this, it's bizarre. We're getting back to basics. Well, yeah. And this, even this conversation we're having now, you know, obviously it will go up online and it will stay and it'll be like a little time capsule because fast forward, you know, even a year or two, like I wonder the conversations we're having now because this has never been experienced before. So everyone's just kind of guessing, you know, the, the way the world, what's going to happen next. So then we listen to it a year later and we're like, wow, like the world has changed this much or maybe it hasn't changed at all. Mm-hmm. You know, I, the, the interesting thing that I've noticed about COVID, and maybe it's the circles that I run in, and I've had this conversation with a friend of mine recently too, that we run in these, depending on who you associate with, the COVID conversations can be negative or positive. So mine have really been, you know, and this, you see that people really want change. So my group of friends and people that I'm associating with and all my social channels and everything that I follow is saying, we need to come out of this with a different perspective. We need to come out of this with a different way of thinking and a different way of communicating with each other and the way that we we do anything now. We need to look at it and really observe and change our actions. That's the conversations I'm hearing on that side. And so I asked my friend and he said, I'm not hearing that. And I went, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. He goes, that's not in everybody's conversation. And I said, yeah, I go, there's this collective. So I wonder now that because there is a group of people that collectively want change in multiple different ways. And then there's some people that just want to go back to being normal and go back to normality. Yeah. So I wonder 
not who's going to win, but how is that going to bleed together? And what is that going to look like? Because I find that all the optimistic, very, very optimistic people are saying, you know what, this is a time that humanity gets to restart. This is a new, you know, resurgence for them. This is a new time that we get to change how we act. And hopefully, I hope on that side that that we run that way rather than the other thinking that comes into play and goes, I just want to stick to norm and we don't change anything. We go back to our our ways that are somewhat destructive, I would say. So, yeah, well, I don't think well, we're going to be able to afford to do that. Again, if you have the income and the privilege to be able to go back to... But we don't know. Mm-hmm. But see, this is the thing, Marie. We don't know because economically, we have no idea. We've never been in this position to know that how this is going to affect us in a recession, mm-hmm. you know, what that recession is going to look like. So we don't know if people are, you know, are going to have expendable money. Are we going to go back to people then, you know, how are we going to be consuming? Is is there going to be money? Are, are housing prices going to go up or down? because of inflation. Yeah. We don't know. A lot of economists are, are guessing and there's tons of different, you know, ideas out there. So, so we don't really know which way we're going to go. If, if housing rates go down, oh man, you know, or if they go up, it can affect us in so many mm-hmm. ways. So, I just can only, either, like, but if, but if inflation a personal ha- level, yeah. on a personal level, I know like I've saved so much money, like my credit card bill when in one month, I went from spending maybe like $1,500 a month on my credit card on just bullshit the entire time. And then I got my credit card bill the other day and I was like $300. My mind was blown. And I was like, and I even looked at it and I was like, well, I didn't really need to get that. And I didn't need to get that order. But for me, I was like, wow, I have so much more power to save more than what I ever thought before. And that's kind of another big thing that I'm getting out of it. And I, I've, I've, I wonder if other people are doing it. I also wonder if anybody else is getting as crazy as I am because I'm starting to wash my Ziploc bags. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to go out to the grocery store to get more. Um, and they're perfectly fine. I just have to wash them. So I, I wash my Ziploc bags. So I know YouTube. people that do that yeah. as well. But, so. I, but, I, but, I, but I've been doing that my entire life, though. You know, I'm like... I, I, it's so smart. The freezer bags are, yeah, it's, well, what, why do you throw them out? Freezer, they can be used. Freezer bags can be used. I didn't want to have to wash them. I love how we just segued into well, freezer bags. It. It's, like, <laughs> it's something, though, where it's like, you think like, oh, well, I had meat in here and it's contaminated. But you also had this on the thing that you cooked it on. You also had it, whatever else you touched it with, probably your hands when you were seasoning it. So who's to say you can't clean the bag too when you're cleaning everything else involved in the process? Exactly. And you're saving things from going to landfill. So it's better for the environment Mm -hmm. and it saves you money and you maintain a certain level of, of being in your like kitchen in life, which I think it's like, it's a great 60 of, it's like a cornucopia of goodness, Mm -hmm. washing your Ziploc bags. There's these crazy little things like you can save money and it's so much easier than we thought. I don't need to go and get my Uber Eats delivery every single day. And I don't need to get you know, I don't, I don't need to be as gluttonous in my day-to-day life. So I think that is going to change the way. So how is it going to be in a recession? I don't know. I like to think that coming out of it, part of it is that people are just not going to be signing as much. One, because we've all been gravely impacted for a period in our lives that we're not earning as much as they were. Like a lot of us are not. We don't have as much. We have to recoup those losses. And mm-hmm. and saving money is just like, it's such a powerful thing. I was like, whoa, my bill was like $300. I felt like I was Shira <laughs> on top. I was like, yes. <laughs> With the power of Grayskull, I am Shira. What? <laughs> Thank it was you. That easy? What? What? Right. Who is this? So our lives are like. Yeah. Lives are constantly changing in pop culture and all pop repeat. That's us. Hmm. Yeah. And then it even goes to stand just like because you have those people and it is going to depend on the person because there are a lot of people who are living on the verge or are were on the verge of being one to two paychecks, like they say, outside of being considered bankrupt. So how many of those people are now going to build a lifetime savings and how many people are just foolishly going to think that the world is going to return and that this is never going to happen inside of their lifetime. I know. I know. It's like anybody who survived the Spanish flu, if they're around, they're just like, Ugh, these guys are amateur hour. <laughs> no, we had to go through. We didn't have half of these things. I've been canning since the twenties. Damn it. Y'all need to catch up. <laughs> right. That's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. Well, and yeah, we we're all, have- Lock bags to clean back in the day. You're oh, so lucky. 
Well, yeah. And also they went through like multiple wars and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Like we haven't, you know, technically. Yeah. It's, it's, it's right. So I think they've gone through a lot more than, than we ever have, you know, that's why they're considered the great, uh, civil, what are they called? Like the great, not the civilization, but like the greatest people or something like that. Yeah. Don't don't give them too much credit. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, they're great, but are they millennials? (laughs) Thank (laughs) <laughs> I mean, th- just the title alone, it's just the upper echelon. Mill. I know, Mill. it's very, like, like it might... <laughs> no, exactly. Can you get any better than that? It sounds like it should be the title of an Avengers film. Avenger Millennia. <laughs> Avenger Millennials. It seems good. It seems like it fit. I mean, we just got rid of the old generation of Avengers. Maybe that's the direction they're heading. I know, exactly. <laughs> well, there is a lot of reboots happening. Very true. These days. Very true. <laughs> oh, uh, we're wow. fun to talk to blast. it has been an incredible <laughs> blast like you guys said you're oh we're sorry for taking over your show and it's like man conversation is the exact way that this should be and it's been incredible <laughs> the entire journey oh, that's cool. well it's been a joy i mean it's so much fun chatting with you thanks for giving us the space to kind of run amok no yeah i'm absolutely glad uh, that i could give you the space and that we could connect like this yeah, it's a rare treat. Mm-hmm. It really is. Go, go, podcasters. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Hopefully. Hopefully yeah. one day in the future, <laughs> once flights open up and stuff, maybe we can meet again, like, actually meet in person. Yeah. But until then, I'm yeah, glad that we were able to get something that works out for the meantime. Absolutely. And I mean, I've been threatening to take Chrissy out one to the East Coast, but then also I love Haida Gwaii. So I want to take her over to BC. We can like swing by Cam Loops. Ooh. Yeah, yes. why not? Whatever ends up happening, just got to stay connected and just figure it out, right? Yeah. yeah that's what else are you going to exactly. do? Yeah, it's a new world now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, whatever the new world ends up coming out of this, I hope that both of you stay happy, stay healthy, and I really wish that both for not only both of you, but also for Alt Pop Repeat. Awesome. Thank you. You too Thank as well. You. Yes, you. you too as well. Awesome. Have yourselves a fantastic <laughs> rest of your day. <laughs> well, you too. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Thank Colton. You. Bye. Bye. The Desert Tiger Podcast. And I truly do want to give one last final roaring DTP thank you to Chrissy Newton and Marie Nicola for an incredibly fun conversation full of laughter. And I mean, we just jumped all over the place, but if you guys have ever listened to Alt Pop Repeat, and I mean, most of you have listened to Desert Tiger before, so I'm sure you guys are pretty used to the concept of uh, things falling off of track and then somehow ending off on an amazing tangent anyway, and it's all in good fun. So that's what really matters. We tackled a ton of topics. It was an absolute blast, and I just can't wait to hear the rest of season one of Alt Pop Repeat, and you should definitely be checking out all the episodes that not only have they released so far, but you should also be subscribing so that when they drop more episodes, you can be hearing them ASAP. Yes, that is right. I also want to go ahead and give one final big old DTP thank you to Amanda. I'm just going to say T, Amanda T, because I don't want to butcher your last name here on the uh, outro here. So yes, big thank you to Amanda T of Vocab for helping with setting this entire conversation up. But last but not least, one of those last roaring TTP thank yous goes to you, the listener, for not only tuning in to today's episode, but for just being awesome in general. Maybe you're new to the show. Maybe you want to join the ambush. Well, the way you do that is by hitting the subscribe button. Maybe you have hit the subscribe button. Well, maybe you want to review the show with some big old five stars on Apple Podcasts. Or we would also love if you could take a screenshot of this episode and share it on your social media. Tag us in it. Chrissy Newton, Marie Nicola, All Pop Repeat, The Colton G, and The Desert Tiger Podcast so that we can show you some mad love for, well, showing us some love because you're beautiful people. Yes, you are. Once again, thank you for joining me for another double episode release week 
here in May. I've been trying to regain some of the ground that I lost earlier, and I appreciate you guys for sticking with me during these times, for tuning in. May is actually the first month in two years, yeah, two years where our Canadian listeners have outweighed our American listeners, which is crazy for a Canadian podcast that mostly features Canadian artists. How we blew up in the States, I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea, but I appreciate every single one of you for tuning in. Next week on the show, I actually haven't made a decision on what direction we're going to go yet, but you can all rest assured that it's going to be another amazing journey through the jungle, through the desert as we put our paws in some sand and, you know, have another amazing interview, another amazing conversation. So until then, bye-bye. Stay beautiful. Yeah, you do that. Honestly, seriously, do it, please.